I'm Margaret Lurie, Senior Manager for Strategy and Engagement at the Museum of Jewish Heritage on the Memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to tonight's program. This is part of our Story Survive Speaker Series, a monthly opportunity for museum visitors to hear testimony from Holocaust survivors and liberators. I want to note that we've just launched our fall season of programming. I see many of you have the print booklets. You can pick one up downstairs. Uh, you can just view our full program schedule, which we've just posted at mjhnyc.org backslash events. You may be particularly interested in an upcoming event on September 10th that I'd like to highlight. That will be Prosecuting Hate Crime, Charlottesville and Beyond, featuring an insider's discussion of the lawsuit represented those injured at the 2017 White Nationalist Rally. Our panelists will be leading litigator Roberta Kaplan, Plaintiff Reverend Seth Wispelwin and Integrity First for America Executive Director Amy Spitalnik. The program will be introduced by Abraham H. Foxman, Director of the Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism here at the museum, and it will be moderated by John Avalon, a senior political analyst at CNN. So once again, it's one to look forward to September 10th at 7 p.m. But tonight, it is our great honor to hear from Eddie Boaz, who is joining us all the way from Australia very international audience here this evening. Um, born in Holland in 1940, Boaz was just three months old when the Nazis invaded, and three years old when his family was rounded up and sent to Holland's four train station. From there, he was loaded into a cattle wagon with his mother, Sarah, his father, Philip, and his older brother, Samuel. They were deported to Westerbork concentration camp and taken from there to Bergen Belsen. They were kept in Star Camp along with 6,000 other prisoners who had been designated for possible exchange with German prisoners of war. It's a remarkable story. Thank you again tonight for joining us to hear it. Now, if I can please ask you to silence your electronic devices, I'll turn things over to Eddie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Friend, American, Dutch, Australian. <laughs> that's good, because that's the only language I know. <laughs> As you've just been told, my name is Eddie Bowers, but I was born Elias Bowers on the 26th of January 1940. Your birthday? On one day, but you're the same day as the grandfather. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My parents always called me Eddie, never Elias. I was named after my, grand, my, mother's, grand, my mother's father, my grandfather, but they always called me Eddie. So on the 26th of January, when I was born, my parents were tickled pink, as we say in Australia. They were happy. I had a brother who was born in 1935, my parents were married in 1934. This is all they call it, of course. Or as they say nowadays, the Netherlands, but I'll keep on calling it Holland, it's easier to say. My parents' families, both of my mother and my father, had lived in Holland since 1700s, so over 200 years. When the Germans invaded Holland on the 10th of May 1940, which was three months and 50 day, 15 days after I was born, my father was fighting the Germans in Holland, about halfway between the city of Lithuania and I was born in The Hague and the German border. And my mother was on her own with two young children, my brother who was five years old and myself who was two months old. And the Germans came in and bombed the day out of a city called Rotterdam and, and the Dutch capitulated five days later and now Ger Holland was occupied by Germany. The occupation of Holland was a little bit different to most of the other European countries. The Dutch Queen and the Dutch government had moved the Dutch Queen to England, London, the Dutch government and the royal family to Canada. The Germans took over the running of Holland 
and appointed a guy called Sais Inquart, an Austrian Nazi, as the head of Holland and the head of the government. The most unique thing about all this was that the government stayed in place. All the, the heads of the government departments now reported to a call of the government, and they did their job like they did for the Dutch bureaucracy at the time. The first thing that the Germans wanted was the census of all the people that lived in Holland. The Dutch bureaucrats gave the census list to the Germans, which of course gave them all the names and addresses of the Jews that lived in Holland. In those days, 140,000 Jewish people lived in Holland, of which about 20 or thousand were refugees from Germany and Poland, and the rest were Dutch-born Jews. Some had seen what was going to happen beforehand, and about 10,000 fled overseas to England, maybe. <coughs> and another five, ten thousand went into hiding, which left 107,000 Jews still in Holland who over the next few years will, most of them, will disappear from this world. Out of the 107,000 Jews deported to concentration camp and 102,000 were murdered, only 5,000 survived. After the Germans took over power, initially life didn't change that much. My father came back in his from, from the war zone, he had stolen a jeep with a few other soldiers, went to, to the Hague, went into our flat, we lived on a three-story flat, we had the middle floor, my mother's brother lived on the ground floor, my mother's sister lived on the top floor. My father hardly ever left the place after he was a tall man, and very fit man, he was a professional bike rider at one stage of his life and he hardly ever left the flat. The Germans soon started to take control of the Jews living home. <coughs> Jewish kids were no longer allowed to go to school, except a school that's run by Jewish teachers who were also kicked out of their job. Any bureaucrat who worked for them, who was a Jewish and worked for the government, was also dismissed. The head of the Dutch High Court was a Jewish man and six other judges. He was dismissed. The six other judges stayed in place till the end of the war and did whatever the Jews told them to do. They never found anyone not guilty. <coughs> Life became pretty tough. Jews were not allowed to own a shop or any business. They had to go to a specially set up bank to deposit all their belongings, money, share certificates, assets that they had. They were only allowed to shop on certain days of the week and a certain hours of the week. Around about 1942, 40, late 41 to 42, things got really tough. We thought that was tough. Jews were no longer allowed to go to the park. They were not allowed to sit on their balconies or on their porch. They were not allowed to virtually do anything. So the thing is that most Jews stayed at home and the Germans, because outside the Germans had set up roast box with the help roast box, with the help of Dutch Nazis, which of course are called NS Davis, which is National Socialist Party. So any Jew that virtually walked the street got picked up that way, which was my father's mother, my grandmother, and my father's sister, my auntie. They ventured out to the shops one day, which were allowed to do in a certain house, but they got picked up and were deported. My son's, my mother's brother, my brother's, my mother's brother, 
and my mother's sisters, she has three sisters, were all picked up off the streets. Then they brought in a rule that Jews had to report to certain places, and when they went, they didn't get back up. They put them on the train to the railway station, reported them to a place called Westerbork, which was a transit camp not far from the German border. My parents stayed inside as much as possible. My mother and my father, as I said, didn't go out. Sometimes at night, they had virtually no money. My parents were hard-working, ordinary Dutch people, Dutch born, and they lived there for 200 years, and they thought they were Dutch. As it turns out, the Dutch thought they were not Dutch, they were Jews. My father served in the army, as I said before. My mother's family had a wholesale fruit business. My father had a fruit shop, and that's how we met. And my father went to buy some fruit from the shop, the wholesale place, and then my mother had men. They paid their taxes, they lived a normal life with people in the streets like my mother babysat for the neighbors, they were friends. But as the war went on, the neighbors didn't speak to us anymore, my mother and father anymore. And going to the shop was dangerous. My mother, who never took no for an answer, she wasn't going to listen to the Germans. She went out certainly in the hours that was allowed. And one day, they knew that our time had to come as well. Most of, all of the family actually, both families, had been deported by 1943. So we had the middle floor, top floor, the mother's sister and us with the lawn, downstairs, my mother's brother and his wife were gone. So they knew that one day we were going to either picked up uh, by the Asia or the Germans would come to our place. So just in 43, 1943, there was a notice came out which was through a Jewish council which the Germans had set up. And that every Jew of that had to report at a certain place, which wasn't very far from where we lived. <coughs> about 20 minutes walking. So my mother and my father ventured outside with me and a friend and my little brother, who was eight years old now, and I was three years old, went to this place to report to the Germans. As my mother was standing in the line, there weren't many Jews left in the Hague, probably none more than about a couple of hundred at that time. She heard a man in front of us say that he and his wife had a Auschwitz, which is an exemption certificate. And she's listening to this man talking, and he mentioned the name of Mr. Blick, who was in charge of that council, had given this to him. My mother said to my father, stay in line, I'm going to take Eddie and Boy, my brother actually was called Boy, to the council, which was just around the corner, and talked to Mr. Flick. My mother's maiden made name was Flick. So she rushed up there, left my father in the line, went upstairs to Mr. Flick. Mr. Flick wouldn't see her. She wouldn't leave till he came to see her. So he came to see her, and he said, you have to give me on your, on your knees. And he had never heard of her. The way my mother, as I said, she doesn't take no for an answer. She was his niece. And you have to give me an exemption certificate, which he did. My mother rushed back to the place where my father was still standing in line, and he got pretty close now. And she's calling out Philip. That's my father's name. Come here, come here. In Dutch, of course, not in English. And Philip turned around and made his way back. He said, she said, let's go, let's go. So out they ran with me and the pram again, went back to our place, 
This was around about May 1943. And we got an exemption certificate, so when they were on the street, my father still didn't go out. My mother did. Um, they weren't picked up. One day, my mother said that I was growing, of course, but you know, there were no clothes to buy for me and my brother. You need some clothing and you need a cap. Like, tell me. That's what she called my father. So she took my brother and myself in a pram, still in the pram, uh, to a shop. And as she, as she walks out around the corner, she bumped into a policeman who knew her from the days that she drove a truck. She was the first female in Holland that drove a truck. She also drove a motorbike, apparently. So the policeman knew her, she was a pretty lady. The, the policeman talked to her for a little bit. Where are you going, Susie? That's my mother's name. I'm going to a shop called the bar. I'm going to buy Eddie and, and Boy a cap. He said, okay. She goes to the bar, buys a As she comes out, there's Derek, the policeman, standing there. He said, Suze, don't look up, just walk next to me, don't say a word, come with me. So he walked next to her, came across a block, okay, a street that was blocked, where the Dutch Nazis were collecting Jews off the street. <coughs> and they called out to, to Derek, that's a nice sketch you got there, Derek, young woman with two kids. He just waited for me to walk. He walked back and myself and my brother back to our place and stood outside the flat all night till the Razi was over. So we lasted another few months till finally one day, in the middle of the night, the front door was locked over, broken, broken, kicked down, and my mother and parents heard these steps coming. And then went up the stairs. They wake up, of course, get up, and up in the living room is a Nazi in his uniform, German Nazi in his army uniform, and a Dutch Nazi and a Spaniard in black uniform. And they said, Get dressed, get a bag, come with us. My mother came into my bedroom, my brother came into the same bedroom, and dressed us. And as she came outside, she had a cup, a, 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 a bottle of baby powder, whatever they called it, a can of baby powder, and threw it at the Dutch Nazi. And he said to her, you made, you made the place dirty. And she said to him, the only dirty thing in this upper room is you. And he hit her with his gun. And then we were pushed down the stairs, into a waiting truck, surrounded by Dutch police, and the neighbours and there were some other Jews in there took us to the railway station, which wasn't far away. We were pushed onto trains and had a two, three hour trip to Westerbork camp, the transit camp. It's a fact of life that the Dutch assisted the Germans in disposing of Dutch Jews. It can't be denied, it's not been denied by anyone in Holland, I know they don't talk about it, but it's a fact, a fact of life. So as you can hear from what I'm saying, I'm not very fond of the Dutch. Well, I'll tell you, today I still follow the Dutch soccer team. I still don't watch the Dutch cyclists in the Tour de France. I'm not against them. I've been there many times over the last few years. It's a fact of life of what I said. I blamed the Dutch people in the 1940s and certainly the Dutch government in the 1940s. We were in Westerbork for about three months and we were due to be deported to a concentration camp. The list comes out every Monday night for Tuesday's train to Auschwitz, to raise the stuff, Bergen-Belsen and other camps. The list came out with our name on it, with Bergen-Belsen on it. 
my mother said to my father, I don't want to go to Birkendalsen, I want to go to Auschwitz, where her family was sent. She had no idea what Auschwitz was, nobody did in those days. My father went to the Germans, we didn't want to know him. My father came back to my mother and said, we've been sent to Birkendalsen. She said, I don't want to go. <laughs> He's lived with her for a while, he knew her pretty well. She wouldn't take no finance from him. So he went back to the Germans and they took us off the list for the next day, they put us on the list that we played at the Bergen Bells. And anyway, so we went on this train. This time they were cattle wagons. You were pushed into the train by the touch. And the train had 906 people on board. We were transported to the German border where a German crew took over from the Dutch crew. We arrived in Bergen Belsen on the 1st of April 1944. I had just turned four years old. We were allocated a barrack, which is like, you know what a barrack is? It's a, it's a hut, a big hut, with bunks, three beds, three high. My brother sat on the top. I was supposed to sleep in the middle, and my mother on the bottom one. When I my mother was, but I stayed with her. Life in Bergen-Belsen was not easy. Bergen-Belsen was a, was divided into four or five different camps. There was prisoners of war from Russia, mainly. There were German uh, freedom fighters. There was a camp called Star Camp, which was for Dutch Jews. Sorry, not all Dutch, mainly Dutch Jews, some Hungarians. <coughs> and the idea that the Germans had come up with is to mm -hmm. have about 6,000 Jews give a special treatment so they would be exchanged for Germans caught in, say, America, in prison during the war, or England in those days. And so for every German soldier that was caught, or any German uh, diplomat, they would exchange a Jew. And that's why, for some reason, we're picked for this. The most people that were picked for this transport were people with relatives in America, or in South America, or in England. Well, we had no relatives in America at all. But we were on this list, maybe it was the name Bogus, which is good Portuguese, Spanish. Nobody knows, I could never find out why we're on the list. So, my mother's being mocked back by the Germans, my father being mocked back by the Germans to send us to Auschwitz. It's one of the reasons I'm standing here in front of you. Not many people escaped Auschwitz. So, as time went on in Bergen-Belsen, and we were there for nearly two years, my father was in a, in a barrack in the men's camp, my mother was in the men's My mother's job was to clean the toilets, the outside toilets, which wasn't very pleasant, and work in the kitchen to the potatoes. <clears throat> and at the end of the war, I just jumped a little bit, the Red Cross have these registration cards for each individual Jewish person who's still alive, probably non Jewish law. My mother's job description was, uh, uh, I was going to say in Dutch actually, potato peeler. <laughs> I'm asked the question, how do I say that in Dutch? I'm thinking, I don't speak, oh, I do speak Dutch, but I've never spoken to anybody anymore since my mother died. Are I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, okay. Got to think about that. Uh, so, life was not easy. My father had a job because he, in the army, he worked in the cavalry with horses. He was given a job of giving horses to look after and a cart 
to pick up all the dead bodies that were lying on the ground in Bergen Belsen and the people that had died in the barracks. It was a terrible job, but it saved our lives. Food in Bergen Belsen was, was terrible. Turnips cooked make a bit of soup with a bit of potato in it and a bit of some piece of bread sometimes. People were dying of starvation, especially kids. We survived, my father thought we survived, because my father was also feeding the horses. And horses were getting carrots and sometimes an apple. So my father <coughs> arranged with my little, my big brother. He was, uh, what was he now? Uh, sorry, 45, he was uh, 10, so he was eight years old. To walk next to him as he's going around the, the camp, and he would pick a place where he would drop some carrots in the ground, and apples, and my brother would crawl <coughs> the pillage bottle around to my mother. And we, she used that to trade food, the clothing for my brother and I. There's no shops in there. So, I was a growing boy, no shoes, clothing, you know, for three, three years to five years, you grow out your, your shirt and your trousers. So, she would see somebody carry and I would get a pair of shoes and things like that. My brother was stealing clothes, clothes, sorry, I must have this. Um, of dead kids lying in the van and then bringing them to my mother for myself and my brother. Ah. It got very cold in the winters in Europe. That was a bit of Europe. I'm sure there's a few of you here. It's very cold. You can't say warm or thin blanket, which is worn out. Uh, the clothing you wear in the winter here. In the winter of 1944-45, which was one of the worst winters Europe has had for many, many years, people were freezing to death and dying, not just of starvation, but of just cold. And a disease called typhus broke out in Bergen Belgium. Thousands died of typhus. My mother told me when I was complaining about cold feet, just pee on your feet. Keep some warm for a little while at least. That's what I did. Bergen Belsen, I mean you've all heard of Bergen Belsen, Anne Frank was there, and everybody I'm sure you just read the book of Anne Frank. Anne Frank quickly, her family were she was born in Germany, the family were German. Uh, refugees who spent time in in a place called Westerbork before they moved to Amsterdam where they found a life for them. They were caught, same as everybody else, either by betrayed by their neighbours or by the Dutch bureaucracy helping the Germans out. They were sent to Auschwitz. Their mother died in Auschwitz, as you all know, I'm not going to repeat this, at Bergen Belsen. And her mother, her Anne Frank and her sister were sent to Bergen Belsen and died in April, both died one after the other, of typhus. Typhus is a disease that thousands of people died of in Bergen Belsen. We were fortunate that none of us got typhus in Bergen Belsen, and we got through Bergen Belsen because of the job my father had, my mother, who never take no for an answer, there's a, a line in the book about, when my brother had stolen something from somewhere, he was told to steal things. You know, there were no police to arrest you and send you to jail. So he became very good at it. But he got caught by a German soldier one day stealing a scarf. 
and my mother was walking not far behind him, and she caught up with the German soldier, the one back there, who said, leave him alone, let him go, and he let him go. And he had a, 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 a rifle in, in his hands, and she started arguing with him, and he was getting cranky and cranky, but there was an announcement being made over loudspeakers, which said for all soldiers to report. And mom, as soon as she turned around, my mother ran with put my brother around. She ran off, the German soldier, by now was about 10 or 20 meters away, ran after her, pushed her in the corner, eventually pushed her in the back, and she fell up on some barbed wire, and for the rest of her life she had a scar above her left eye. The German soldier then left, and uh, and my mother couldn't take note of an answer. She was certainly heard. She, she saw the eyeball apparently was sort of pretty badly damaged and all that. There was a, obviously a few doctors amongst the Jewish people there. One of the doctors there helped her out of it. So life was pretty tough. And as the war went on, the British, the Americans, the Russians, the Russians from the east, the British from the east west, and the sorry, the British, the British from the west, and the Americans from the south and east. The British had surrounded Bergen Belsen in April of early April 1945. The Germans decided that they didn't want the British to catch any Jews there, find any Jews there. The same as they did in Auschwitz, the reason Anne Frank was supported because the Germans knew that the Russians were going to liberate Auschwitz. And they shipped, they wanted to ship them out from the east to the west. So they decided the British, sorry, the, the German Nazis who ran Bergen Belsen to put the Jews on a train to a place called Theresienstadt in the east, which was in Czechoslovakia, what was called in the Czechoslovakia. There were three trains. They departed between the 6th and the 10th of April. Nobody can confirm actually the actual date, except my mother, who knew exactly when we had left. So we had to march all the Jews uh, close to 6,000 Jews that were in the star camp at the march to the rail platform about six kilometers away and waited on the platform for the trains. The first train left around about the 7th of April with mainly Hungarians on board. The second train left about the 8th of April with mainly Dutch and some Hungarians on board. The third train was all Dutch, about 1,500 on, and on which we were pushed, the four of us. My mother, my father, my brother and I. And I was five years old. There were cattle wagons, no food, no water. The, the normal time of the trip would have taken from, in those days, from Bergen Belsen to Theresienstadt is probably a day. The first train was liberated by the Americans. The second train made it to Theresienstadt, and nobody knows what's happened to the passengers on board that. The third train, which is our train, was liberated 14 days, two weeks later, by the Russians. What was happening in Germany in those days, the Americans and all the Allies were either bombing the railway lines to try and avoid the German troops from escaping. So our train, which is 14 days, went north, south, it zigzagged its way through Germany to Berlin where the train was stuck for two days because no, the Germans didn't know what to do with the train. They didn't want to be caught by the 
by the Americans or the Russians. So, for two days, no food, no nothing. The only way to get food is when the train stops or bombing or something, jump off, go to the farm, steal some potatoes, which my mother did, my father was getting sick, and would bring potatoes back to the train. One of those occasions, my mother jumped off, and when she came back, the train was gone. And she was with a, with a friend of hers, and she and her friend decided to walk along the railway track and further up there's a train standing there and it's the Hungarian train. So they jumped on that Hungarian train, that's the train number two that actually made it to the and stuff. But as they go along, the train stopped again and on the other track was the Dutch train. So she jumped off, she ran along there called that little Philip apart. If she hadn't, she would have been sent to Dresden and stuff. So the Russians liberated this train on the 23rd of April, 1945. The train got surrounded by Cossacks on horseback and carts. My brother was the first one to see the Russians. My father and my brother jumped off the train and so did everybody else. The German, the German Nazis had all fled by then and the Russians liberated the trains. To all the 2,400 people had died on the train as part of the salvation. So there's about 2,000 left. Took the 2,000 Jews off the train to a little town called Trobitz. The Russians kicked the Germans, a lot of the Germans, out of their homes and put Jewish people in there. We were located in a school on the outskirts of Trobitz. My mother to this day, maybe some of your Americans may not believe this, does not, spoke nothing else but good of the Russians. The Russians did everything to help those 2,000 Jews. The only thing they couldn't do is supply food, and they actually told them, just don't steal food. But what was happening was, because of typhus had broken out, the laws of the Russians were infected by typhus, and so were the German population. So the Russians decided that everybody who wasn't well, they would send them on a bus further into the west, towards a place called Leipzig, which was occupied by then by the Americans and the English. And there was a little town called Riza, this side of the River Elba. The River Elba splits Germany in two, sort of. And we were still on the east side. So we were in Riza. But now you're into May. Still no food, except what you steal. My mother got pretty sick. And she asked my father to get us some chicken soup. Now those of you who are Jewish know that chicken soup is Jewish medicine. But of course, my father and my brother went out to find some chicken soup, but couldn't find any because they stole the chicken from somewhere. And he tried to make it chicken soup, which she said was very nice, but I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> so, my father decided, when asked towards the end of May, so we've been on this train and maybe six weeks by now, and living, you know, this beggars that he wanted to go back to Holland, find his way back to Holland. So with food, he bribed one of the Russian soldiers to take the four of us on the jeep to the River Elba, which he did, dropped us off. And on the other side were the Americans. And there was a bridge there. So the Americans had four gypsies there who wanted to go to, to the east. They, they swapped the four gypsies for the four of us. So the Americans put us up in the school. Again, food is not what they could help us with, so you had to go steal back. My brother was the best of them. He was, he was pretty good at stealing things by now. And begging, he got good at One day, a British soldier came across my brother. My brother, who couldn't speak English, of course. Somehow led him to where my mother and I was now with typhus 
and I said I was five years old. And the British soldier took my mother and my brother and my father to the British Army Field Hospital where they gave us medication, gave me medication, survived typhus. Typhus is a disease that very few people survive. If after five days you still have typhus, that's when it really set in. And the only way you survive if you could last another seven days. Once you've gone past day 12, you'll survive. I just made it past day 12. And the British soldier, Captain Douglas was his name, looked after me, looked after my mother, my father had got better, my brother, he never got sick. Um, the British soldier and an American doctor put us on a train to Holland. We arrived back in Holland on the 30th of June, 1945. I am rushing a little bit through the whole thing because we've got an hour all together, so I can do it one piece and time for questions as well. So, we arrived back in Holland, the Red Cross meters. That's where my mother and my father found out that their whole family is one now. Between the two, 64 members of their family. I never had an auntie, I never had an aunt. I never had a nephew, I never had a cousin, well, sorry, I never had a cousin or a niece. My birthdays after the war, were initially my father, my mother, my brother, and I can't tell you the other part in a minute. So when we got back to, to Holland, we got registered by the Red Cross, they found out they had no family, we take a bus to The Hague, we get out of the bus, my parents go to the, the flat to where we used to live, which is 39 Kraken Holstein, that's Dutch, and uh, knocked on the door, people open the door, what do you want, but well, this is our flat, no it's not, it's our flat, get lost, and they went to the Dutch police, they told them to get lost, they went to the city council, they told them all in one day. Because nowhere to live, nowhere to stay. Again. So they heard about a, a, a monastery just not far away in the Hague of convent, and they went there and they put us up. And my father went around the city looking for relatives and he found a non-Jewish aunt who was running a pub. A pub. Is that American? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hotel that sells beer. It's not a hotel where you stay with um, sells some drinks. And uh, my, my distant auntie, there you go, got an auntie, put us up. And it's the first time that I live in a real life. Somebody's home, a real bed. Food, real food. I was nearly five and a half years old, but it's about the first time I had a glass of milk. Never seen vegetables before. To this day, I don't drink milk and eat vegetables. <laughs> except spinach. I do like spinach. I don't eat any other vegetables and do not drink them. I survived because of all my parents, my mother especially, did for me. We had no home when we came back. They didn't give up. They talked a Jewish council, which was set up by the then Dutch government, who had returned from Canada and America and, and uh, England. They were put up in a, in a flat, similar ground floor in the middle. We were given the middle, the ground floor, the two elderly people, and the top floor was a young couple with a baby. The four of us, my brother had to share a room upstairs with the young couple and the baby, and then I had to share a room with the father and the mother. There were no windows in the place. So now they had to make a living for themselves. They had no money. My father tried to find out where any assets that his parents had, my grandmother, and they had no money, my parents. And uh, they got no help from the Dutch government. I'll come to a bit more of that in a second. So my mother 
uh, the Dutch government gave everybody in Holland uh, food stamps and stamps to buy clothing with. My mother got those stamps like everybody else did. In Holland, they were not everybody in the not just the whole population. So my mother went to a department store called the Bankhof, <coughs> I think I pronounced it right, where she bought some dress material because she needed dresses. So she couldn't sell it for a million years, but she made herself a dress out of this material. One day the milkman, in those days they still delivered milk and bread to your home. <coughs> the milkman came and delivered some milk. He said, oh, that's a nice dress you're wearing, Mrs. Bowers. And the person said, would you like one for your wife? And he said, oh, could you get me one? She said, no problems. She ran up to the baker, bought another piece, and the milkman told the baker, the baker told the butcher, and that's how she got some money by selling dresses that she really could have made. And uh, my father went on a push bike with a car in front selling fruit and they got themselves going, got some money. They then managed to get a market stall at one of the market places in, in The Hague and they started to make a life for themselves. They opened a shop actually in 1947 selling a haberdashery shop, selling clothing material and then they could do it because hey, my mother was a dressmaker. <laughs> Unfortunately, with all the stress caused by the war and the Dutch government, my father passed away in 1948. I was eight years old, eight and a half. My brother was 13. But in the meantime, a little sister was born. And there's one of her sons sitting right there, stand up. <laughs> We lived in the United States. My little sister was born in 1947. My father died in 48. She was 18 months old. The joy didn't last very long. My mother was a, a widow. The shop is their income. But they always wanted to get out of Holland or Europe because they didn't trust the world. They believed that the Holocaust could happen again. To be honest with you, I believe it can happen again. Regardless of that, my mother went on, but she wanted to get out. The only distant relative they had was my father's auntie, who was a sister of his mother. We lived in Australia. We got an immigration uh, certificate. She had to pay her own fare. We paid our own fares. It was my mother widow, myself, my brother, and my little sister. We finally managed to get on a, on a boat early 1954. I had my 14th birthday on the boat, on the ship. I'm sure it was a boat or a ship. On the ship going to Australia, it took in those days about six or eight weeks to get there. We arrived in Australia, made our way, nobody can do this, made our way to this people's where my auntie lived, or distant auntie lived, um, and took us in. Unfortunately, that didn't work out too well. In the meantime, my brother had, had talked somebody into renting us a flat for an exchange of 100 pounds, what they call key money, which is a bribe. And as I said before, it became very good at all those things, <laughs> even as he got older. Um, and uh, we moved into this flat, no furniture, no nothing, no money. I went to school, my sister went to public school, I went to high school, uh, my sister was seven years old, uh, I was 14, my brother was 18, my brother got himself a job. Unfortunately, my brother, because of what I've been saying about what he had to do in all those years, he thought stealing and begging was normal. Yeah. You know, when you are a child like that. For many years I did not appreciate that. I did eventually. And I looked out to him once I did right. My sister, I helped as well. I was fortunate that Australia was good to me. I left school at 15. I 
was no good at school anyway. I argued in Holland with the teacher that one on one is three and kicked me out of school as a six year old uh, at the new school. I got a job at a radio station in Sydney. I worked there for six years and then got a job as a salesman and I became a pretty good salesman. Made a life for myself in Australia. I was offered a job by I started to work for a big American company and uh, I was offered a job. I was friendly with the CEO, I don't know if I talk about through that story, but I give you his name and you can look him up. His name was Robert Louis Dreyfus, who became a well-known businessman. And he and I got on well. Uh, I was a very junior person. He, he offered me a job in the United States. I just got divorced. I've got two sons, of which one of them is sitting here. Or stand up, Philip. <laughs> Well, I have to come today, especially to come and hear me speak. And uh, he offered me a job in, in the United States to run a company in New Jersey. And uh, my financial controller was there. I won't ask you to stand up this, but she is there. Who used to be the financial controller of the company. And I lived in, I lived in uh, the Upper East Side. Paid for by the company, by the way, yeah. so I had no money um, for four years before returning to Australia, where I returned having learned a lot about business in America, and I can say to you, I made a successful life for myself. I do quite a bit, I wrote a book about my life, because my mother died in 2001. I always thought I owe it to my mother, that nobody should forget, uh, we as a family, which apparently is unique, according to the Red Cross, survived as a family. So I started writing my book in 2002, it took me 15 years to write. I launched it in 19, sorry, 2017. And I enjoyed talking to people like yourself about it. And the same way I enjoy it, I believe it's a need that people do not forget the Holocaust. I'm relatively young. I'll be 80 in January. You can all work that out from 1940. But I'm healthy. Uh, when the opportunity came to come to America, I was invited by the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington to do a book signing on the 1st of September. I wrote to the museum here, who welcomed me with open arms to come and talk. And the same in LA, I'm speaking at the Holocaust Museum there. I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk to Americans. I do a bit of speaking in, in Australia to schools and things like that because I believe, and I believe I'm not a reader. I believe when you talk to people, I can only put so much in an hour, and that's what we really need in speaking. Uh, the book is a bit longer than that. Uh, but I believe the Holocaust should not be forgotten, and I really appreciate all of you for coming here to listen to me my story. I'm happy to answer any question, and I mean any question you would like. Thank you. Yeah, this gentleman has a microphone. Actually. No, I don't need it. Believe me. It's on the camera. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, most Americans have the image of Holland as always being very anti-Nazi. Now, I've heard a few things, including from you, that indicates it wasn't quite so rosy. Obviously, you, during the time of the occupation, you, can't, you were too young to extrapolate. But when you came back, and from what you found afterwards, what would you say was the percentage of people who were horrified as to what the Nazis were doing to the Jews, what percentage were glad, and what percentage were just totally indifferent? I'm not sure I can talk percentages. First of all, uh, only 5,000 Jews survived out of 107. That's the highest per head of population of any country in the world. Sorry, any country in Western Europe. Denmark, same size as Holland, 95 of the population survived. When the Jews were ordered to wear a Star of David in Holland, 
the, the Dutch just took it. In Denmark, the king of Denmark and the whole population went on the streets with the Star of David. That's one of the differences why. What percentage of the, of the I can't read your percentages, but a very small percentage that uh, welcomed the Jews back, there'd be uh, a large percentage that tolerated it, and it would have been a small percentage, I would say, that hated it, so hated it in the word of that, that, That's my Thank guess. Um, I, I can't, all I can tell, tell, tell you about is how the Dutch government behaved after the war, and that was going to take me too long to explain to you, but I'll tell you the what. It was in 1974, which is nearly 20 years later after the war finished, that the Dutch government brought in a compensation scheme for Holocaust survivors. 20 years ago, and, and I tell you, and I wasn't entitled to a penny of it. Because by then, I'd made a life for myself in Australia, and I was earning too much money for them. But I was only earning a wage. But I don't care, I don't need any money especially today. Uh, sorry, the gentleman else was, you still have a question? Yeah, I'll just get the microphone, so, microphone please. So, very few people who ever lived went through something like what you went through. Um, my question is, what level of anger have you carried since then, and what level of forgiveness my mother always my mother always said you can forgive but you can't forget I have no anger in me whatsoever I have no forgiveness in me my mother did that's probably a big difference between me do I dislike Germans? no I don't I dislike the generation for today's generation. I had a German boss that he worked with a man who wrote all papers. I had to report to him now. I was telling somebody just now. I had an opportunity to do well in America and part of that was going to Germany to talk to my boss in, in Frankfurt and Munich. And I was going to let the Germans ruin my life again. So I made my trips to Europe. But I only stayed as long as, long as I had to in Germany. Uh, my son got a job with Adidas in, in uh, Nuremberg when he went on a trip to Europe and Australia. And uh, I had a dilemma. Would I go and see my son or in Nuremberg of all places? <laughs> hey, it's my son. I'm not going to let the Jews stop me from seeing him. So, no, I don't have any anger. Sorry, just, just a bit. Question. Uh, first one, first one is uh, you had difficulty in living in, in Holland until uh, 1954. Do you consider your family consider going to Israel at that time? And if not, why? The second question is you were very young. Do you have any personal recollection of that period? What's the earliest recollection that you have from that period? I'll answer the second question. Uh, first, no, I have no recollection. I'm told the Dutch government, when I told them that in the consul in, in, in Holland, didn't believe me. They sent me to a psychiatrist. <laughs> My family will tell you that I'm the last person in the world that needs a psychiatrist. <laughs> and that's what the psychiatrist told me too. But I block everything about the war out of my mind. I, I live my life very simple way. I live for today. I can't do much about what happened in the past and tomorrow is another day and I've lived all my life like that. Second question about Israel, the answer is no. As far as I know, there was no consideration. I went to Israel myself when I, from 1964 when I went on a hitchhiking trip to Europe and spent three months on a kibbutz and enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, but I went back to my mother and my sister in Australia. So that's my answer to that, ladies. First question, what's the name of your book? Uh, <laughs> we have copies for sale in the shop on the first floor. <coughs> if 
I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. And you see here the picture of Gregor Bell's concentration camp, and you see at the bottom the picture of the beach. The beach is in the suburb where I grew up in Australia. So the difference of the victim and survivor I try to express in the cover. I just wanted to know what your family's um, relationship, if you knew, before the war was to Jewish practice, and did it change? Because it seems to me like you have all these Nisan, all these, all these miracles that happened to you, partly because of your mother and your father, but it just seems extraordinary. My mother's family, I wouldn't say they were religious Jewish people, but they had their Friday nights with the family. Uh, they never had any thrive for pork or ham or, or shellfish in their house. After the war, I can only talk about Australia, uh, my mother would not allow ham or pork in the house. Or, and I had never eaten, well, I never know what, and pork or whatever, shellfish. You <laughs> said Never, never. And I'm not religious, but I believe, and I know many of you are not Jewish, I believe that everyone who has Jewish parents and don't believe in being a Jew all have something Jewish inside them. Like me, it's not eating. Others have go to their holy place, the synagogue. I used to be younger, I don't anymore. I'm a member of the synagogue, but I haven't been there in years. Do I believe in the religion? I don't know. I believe the Jewish religion is a tradition, which I believe strongly in, but a religion I'd rather not talk about, if you don't mind. Could turn on the Jews. My mother didn't. She was well known in the Hague, which was only a small city in those days, about 500,000 people. Uh, so, no, they, they never did. And they probably didn't have the money to pay somebody to go to Hague or flee. So, yeah. And my father would have always stood up anyway as soon as he was very sort of there and there before. He was there before they were big fellas, and he was a big man. So, I think it's his name. So, um, so how did your brother turn out and uh, how did your parents, did they have any psychological um, manifestation you know, from, from the uh, experience? I come from my brother in I, I can only talk about my mother. I didn't know my father well enough, Sorry. you know. Um, I would say no. Uh, there's only, I've only got two photos of me and my father, you know, and they were, I was lying in bed together, and, and that thing when I was five, six years old, so no. My mother, psychological, no. She wasn't scared of anything. And my sons and my nephew there will back that up. Whatever Susie said, Susie said, and Susie, the grandchildren know about, my grandchildren now know about Susie Omar. Uh, no, my mother was a very strong, I would be here with Oscar and my father and my mother. Uh, she was too strong to have any son. And, and uh, you know, and I'm not saying she didn't have it, but certainly not. I would I personally say most people would have something. She never spoke about anything in the war till she went in an in a, in a old people's home where she met other survivors, a Jewish home, and they talked. And then she started, and she did an interview with the Shoah Foundation that the Spielberg funded, the Blue Book of Australia. But no, not, not open. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Can I spend two minutes on my brother? Please. Okay, so my brother came to Australia, and as I said before, 
all it up. Most of his life is still a bed. And that's what he continued to do in Australia in a way. Nothing really big time. He didn't break into houses or anything, but he could steal money uh, by writing a tough check, things like that. Got into trouble with the police. It's something that my mother didn't need. I started, the brother didn't live at home anymore. I started to look after my sister and my mother. I worked sometimes two or three jobs at the same time and paid help my mother. My mother, within a week of arriving in Australia, she went to the local hotel, real hotel, but guest in it, and got a job as a clean bay. And she worked most of all her life, but most of the time in Australia, she went to work in, in, in a cake shop and a, and a, in the end in a dress shop because she was a dressmaker. <laughs> but even not speaking English well, she was, uh, she was doing those things. Um, my mother was fortunate and, and, and that she met a man, a Jewish man, who had no children, who was a widow, and asked her to marry him in 1962, I think it was. She asked my permission. Of course, I said yes, and unfortunately, he died seven years later of cancer. But the good thing was, he left her home to live in, which she didn't have before. So that was the good thing. No, no, no. So my brother gave my mother a lot of grief, and it was decided it was best for him to go back to Holland to live, where he could get on a pension, and he did, but again got into trouble with the police and actually went to jail for three months. He was sent to jail for three months for arriving at that, that check. Now, that wasn't the first time he'd been caught. I wasn't very close to my, my brother in those days. I was working hard and I you know, didn't understand. As I got older and I started to do better and I went to Holland quite a few times for business, I, I met him and his wife and I could see they had no money or nothing. I was doing well. He was sent to jail, and I was quickly told you just to answer the, I'd answer the black man, gentleman's question over there. He was sent into jail, he was put in a cell by the judge next door to the worst Nazi criminal who was responsible for sending all the Dutch Jews in Amsterdam to the concentration camps. In the cell next to him was the one who was responsible for sending, sending all the Dutch Jews in the Hague. So I had no empathy whatsoever, the Dutch. And he he talks about that. He told me the whole story. That these Germans treated them as if nothing had happened. And they got pardon, pardon, yeah, whatever. Pardoned. Pardon. I was trying to speak French here. Uh, pardoned by the Dutch Queen, you know. I mean, um, one to the centers. So, yeah, the question about my brother. Uh, that's the answer. No, he passed away uh, in 2017. Uh, so, only recently, uh, I went to Holland, of course, to his funeral. My sister passed away in 2015, 12, 12, 12, 2012, in Houston. I was fortunate to have this one the week with her while she was in the hospital. Uh, on the one left. That's another reason for writing the book. Until 100 times. I didn't hear it. Until 120, you'll be around. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, I think it's